Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Wilson Malay. I'm head of the Department of Social Work and Social Care at Kingston University. We're really pleased to welcome you today to this uh, live event and thank you for attending. It is with uh, great pleasure that we're able to welcome over 600 people that have enrolled to attend today's event, which is really fantastic and shows the commitment that we all have, particularly the attendees, students, staff, partner agencies and the wider community who all have an interest in developing their understanding and knowledge of dementia. We're really delighted to be working in partnership with Alzheimer's Society and our local dementia friendly community group to present today's event. Uh, you may want to know that um, in addition to today's event, there are also other events that you can attend next week as part of Dementia Action Week and you will hear more about this today. I was just um, keen to introduce and welcome you to this live event and now I'm just going to hand over to my colleague Maria Brent who's leading this work from our department and she's working with Paula to tell us more about today's event. Over to you, Marianne Paula, and enjoy the event. Thank you, Wilson. Uh, yeah, absolutely, such a warm welcome. We're so excited that so many of you are able to join us for today's dementia event. And as Wilson's explained, the event's been planned in collaboration with our dementia friendly community, which I'm a part of and represent the university at, and is led by Paula D'Souza. And Paula's going to tell us more about the exciting events that are planned for next week. We'll then be able to explain what's happening today. We've got a really exciting interactive afternoon for you. But first of all, I'll introduce Paula, who will be able to tell you more about the excellent work that the Dementia Friendly Community Group are doing at the moment. Paula, over to you. Thank you, Maria. Um, and hi, everybody. Um, as Maria said, my name is Paula D'Souza and I'm the Dementia Friendly Communities Coordinator for Kingston, working for the Alzheimer's Society. Uh, and I'm so happy to be here and to be supporting this fantastic event today. A dementia friendly community is one where people are, who are affected by dementia are supported and understood and able to access all the parts of the community that are meaningful to them in the way that they would like to. That might be a GP surgery that allows extra time for appointments and it involves your carer. It could be a library that doesn't charge you every time you misplace your library card. Or it could be a cinema that has dementia friendly screenings where there's more lighting and a planned interval in the performance. And I believe that anything that makes the community easier for people with dementia to, to navigate, to be involved in, actually makes it easier for all of us, um, whether that's having clearer signs um, or more seats available or perhaps even a, a quiet shopping hour. And my role is to raise awareness of dementia in the area and to work with different services and organisations in Kingston to make them more dementia friendly and to bring everyone together so that we can learn from each other and also to increase our impact. And it's been such a pleasure to have Kingston University as a really key and active member, both of our community, but also of my steering group, which helps to lead us um, and helps us to decide on our priority areas. And we really want people with dementia themselves to be at the heart of all the decisions and the actions that we take. And so I'm currently working to build up a dementia voice user involvement group in our area too. This last year has been so challenging for people affected by dementia. And our Alzheimer's Society report, Worst Hit Dementia During Coronavirus, shows how they really have been hardest hit by the pandemic with less contact with family and friends, with regular services like day centres and lunch clubs closed, with changes to routines, which are, you know, can be so important. It's been so isolating and confusing for people. And for carers, there's been much less opportunities for, for respite care and for support for themselves. We know that 83 percent uh, of people are reporting that there's been a deterioration in their symptoms of dementia during the lockdowns and 95 percent of family carers tell us that the extra hours that they've had to put in to support their loved one is taking a toll on their physical and mental health. 
And that's even before we talk about the, the general challenges and worries that we've all had living through a pandemic. But we know that even in non-COVID times, uh, carers are struggling and our current care system isn't really set up to provide the right support um, because of the unique needs that people with dementia have. But it is possible to live well with dementia and there is so much more to the person than, than just their diagnosis. And we believe that everybody should have access to the right help and support without a crippling financial impact. And that's why this Dementia Action Week, we're calling on the government to cure the care system and to give social care the appropriate funding so people with dementia and their carers can be fully supported. So I'm inviting you all to support our campaign and to sign our petition. You can just search for Cure the Care System or follow the link that will pop up uh, uh, in a moment into the chat box. And there are lots of other ways you can get involved and support us this Dementia Action Week. So that could be by becoming a dementia friend if you haven't already attended one of our information sessions. Uh, I'm running one next Tuesday if anyone's interested. You could look to be fundraising or volunteering to support people with dementia and also letting people with dementia know that help and support is out there and the Alzheimer's Society is there to support anyone affected with any type of dementia. And you can see our website alzheimers.org.uk for further information. And if you have any questions about Dementia Action Week or about our dementia friendly community work here in Kingston, then please feel free to get in touch. Again, I'll put my email address up in the chat box um, and I'd really love to hear from you. Uh, so thank you very much for your time today um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Back to this afternoon. So raising awareness of dementia and developing our understanding and knowledge has, has been a real central part of our students learning here at the university and I just wanted to thank a colleague of ours Denise Fort a senior lecturer in the nurse school of nursing who's recently retired and she's really been at the forefront of keeping that focus on dementia and we're building on her good work today with this event I do doubt that many of us here either professionally or personally have not been affected by dementia and the purpose of today's event is to share that good practice, to share our understanding so we can develop the skills and knowledge to support each other as human beings, as students, as professionals, to develop a, a learning community. And how we're going to do that today, we're delighted to have a range of speakers. So we have social workers, we have Jane uh, Knight, who will provide a perspective from the care home, and we've also got our student nurses. And what they'll be doing today is sharing their reflections, sharing their learning of how they've supported people with dementia through this extremely challenging year with COVID-19. So we will have a question and answer session. We want this to be an interactive session today. So please post your questions in the chat box and we'll be able to pose those questions to the speakers after their talks. Due to COVID-19, we're also really aware that many of us have experienced significant loss. And we wanted to recognise that today, as many carers, loved ones have been unable to be with their, their loved ones and families at those really difficult times. So we'll be having a moment of reflection, which will be led by Hamad, our spiritual faith leader. But we're also really mindful that what we talk about today may well raise powerful emotions for you. Um, and we'll also be sharing helplines that you can access immediately to gain support and guidance about what the issues might be raised for you today. After that, I'm going, I'll be delighted to introduce just after around two o'clock, 2.10, Belinda and the Theatre Company. So we've worked with Belinda and the Theatre Company before and they'll be sharing their event, Grandma Remember Me, which is a fantastic play that they've managed to convert into a film. And it's a really moving story that shows the impact of dementia on a family, particularly the relationship with a grandmother and granddaughter. Each member of the cast have all had personal experience of dementia. And you'll again have a Q&A session where you can pose questions to them, ask about some of the messages that they've portrayed in the film. So in terms of housekeeping, uh, we'll all be on mute today, but please do use that chat box because we'll be able to, to look at that and pose your questions to the speakers 
and also Belinda and the cast after their play today. So with no further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce you to our first speaker. So we have Vicky Middleton, who's an experienced social worker at Kingston Adult Community Services and Simon Barth, the team manager, who are going to be sharing with you some of their experiences and key learning through this last difficult year of COVID-19, supporting people affected by dementia. Thank you. Hi, Vicky. How are Hi, you? Hi, Good, thank you. Yes, not too bad, thanks. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining me, Vicky. It's a privilege to be part of the Dementia Awareness um, Celebration event. Um, uh, a really important event and uh, particularly like the, the ethos around all of us coming together, professionals, people from the community, individuals uh, with dementia and uh, families um, alike uh, to sort of learn from one another and to come together to, to discuss uh, the experience of, um, of the last year or so and just um, the experience of people with dementia in general, of mm -hmm, course. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's hard to describe from a social services perspective. It's difficult to describe really what the last 12 to 14 months has been like. Um, seeing sort of human tragedy, but also the best of human nature. Uh, seeing a lot of coming together, a lot of pulling together to to achieve great things. It's particularly helpful that you've joined us because you come from a, uh, a frontline practitioner's perspective. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, what's your experience been like over the over the last year or so working with uh, people with dementia in the pandemic? Well, I thought um, I'd just tell you about one particular lady that I've been working with, and for for the purposes of anonymity, oh, can't say it properly. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm going to talk, I'm going to call her Jean today and um, Jean is a lady, she's in her mid 80s and she's got an underlying cognitive impairment, however she hasn't been diagnosed yet because actually during the um, pandemic it's taken a lot longer to be able to do some of the diagnosis, obviously people have um, mm. not been able to go in and have those face to face visits with mm. the um, mm the teams that do the diagnosis. Um, so um, uh, Jean, she's um, came to my attention in, back in August 2020. Um, it's been a frequent faller since then and um, we as social workers haven't been going out to do visits unless there's a particular um, priority need to do yeah. that. Yeah. And there's in exceptional cases, we can go to our managers and ask mm. to, to make a visit. And with Jean, I really felt that I needed to. Mm. Um, she's a bit fallen back in August um, and, and had, had a long stay in hospital. And um, Jean is a uh, high risk of self neglect. Mm. Um, she had had to have a big deep clean. Mm. Um, her house was in a terrible state. And when Jean came home, she was really quite angry about the deep clean right. because her house didn't look like her own, you know. And um, we can all imagine that. Imagine going mm. away and then suddenly you come home and you think, hang on, this isn't mine. Yeah, absolutely. What, yeah. What, who's been in my house? Mm. And very sort of suspicious thoughts as well about what people were doing, looking at mm. her things. Mm. Which so is my, very understandable, isn't it, really? It's, it's, uh, yeah, absolutely. So my role was really to build that trust with, with Jean. Mm. Um, and um, so what I've done is focused a lot about what Jean likes doing and focusing on her strengths. And Jean, mm. um, up until before COVID, she's still been working, you know, she's been in mm. the mid ages, but still working. She's been a performer all her life. So she's very, very darling, darling. Um, <laughs> And um, she's uh, had bit still doing teaching in that area. Yeah. Uh, people were coming to her home before it yeah. um, became yeah. so neglected. Yeah. Um, and um, she, her work has kept her young. She's still got a young mind despite having yeah. this really poor short term memory. Yeah. Um, so sadly, but in October, uh, Jean did have another fall. Mm. This time the police had had to knock down the door. I'd found out that the heating wasn't working, the toilet was not working. There were lots of jobs that needed to do be done. And I thought, first of all, she can't go home again. We've got to get this work sorted out. It's not safe for her to go mm. home. So mm. as social workers, we have to do those risk assessments. Mm, she was sent to um, a temporary placement in a residential mm. home. 
And then I realised this isn't the right thing for Jean. <laughs> yeah. She hates it in this residential home. She's still got a young mind. She can't believe she's in this home. What is she doing there? And who is going to be going into her house again? I, yeah. I thought, no, I discussed it with my manager through the risk assessment and decided the best thing is we're going to get her home and yeah. get her involved in getting the work done because that yeah. way she's still holding some control. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that that worked very well actually because mm. when we got home although um there was a heck of a lot of work to be done together we worked as a team to do that and something i wanted to share with everyone today was mm. about the importance of lasting power of attorney because mm. Jean, she does have a lasting power of attorney she's actually got two people to help her with her health and welfare mm. but sadly due to covid um mm. and the restrictions of them being able to visit her mm. they help and they live a long way away one is actually a, an elderly friend of hers is it older than Jean herself um mm. she's a lovely lady but you know she's got no access to the computer mm. wasn't really be able to help and the other lady was uh, unable to help either so that meant that a lot of the work fell to social services whereas ideally if mm. somebody got a lasting power attorney as you know Simon we would try and encourage them to mm the work for us so I yeah, did get very you. involved with Jean and that yeah. needed to be done to keep her safe really yeah. but yeah. she was really really pleased with with the the work that um we did together and we you know it's all about kindness Jean though can still lose her temper very quickly with me probably yeah. due to that <laughs> cognitive yeah. underlying impairment and she can go from naught to ten and really shout at me <laughs> um, <laughs> if I don't do things the way she wants them to do because what I've realized is that she you know I've got to let her have the control it's mm, still mm. her life and I think that's so important for people with dementia mm. get them fully involved in their care plan mm. wherever they can to treat her with the dignity and respect that she deserves mm, um mm. and then um uh, again sadly we've had another fall recently and um poor Jean she has had to go to um, a rehab centre and then again to a residential home and her life has become even more limited now she's micro living mm. and this time she had to go to the camp because she got mice in her house mm. uh, we had to sort that out through social services and she agreed she didn't want to go home with the with the mice everywhere that's mm. I you know my colleague um, from OT actually uh, found these mice with me when we were going to do an access visit to yeah the 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 uh, visit for the equipment for her to be in her room downstairs for the downstairs. That's, occup that's occupational therapy isn't it OT? Oh that is yes sorry mm -hmm. occupational therapy mm -hmm. um and um we uh, Jean was able to speak to me on the phone understood this time that she was going to the care home and actually was in agreement for it because she knew it, she could she can understand that's the right thing she didn't want to go yeah. home like that and um, poor Jean she had to leave from the hospital and just go to this care home with nothing mm. and I said to her what Jean what can I you know I'm gonna she'd given me permission to go into a house I went with a colleague we always do that to protect ourselves because mm. you know particularly as the last time we knew that it had upset her people going in her home and mm. um, so we get written agreement for her to allow us to go in and um, I said look well, I'm we're going to be going in uh, can I bring you anything which well, Jean tells it is back into being a bit of a muddle um mm. so mm. the clothes were piled up high um and she said to me no 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 darling i can't can't have that can't have that Pe people that brought me things last night brought me all the completely wrong things um yeah. I said, Jean, we were you know please let us try and bring you something and make your stay more comfortable and uh, my colleague and i we went in and we managed to find us some nice outfits things mm. that she, look nice. she likes to still look nice and, and um, we saw on a on a dressing table her face creams, and we thought, oh, we'd like them as we'll yeah, take them. Yeah. And when we took them to her in the home afterwards, I had to just sort of pass them through the door. And I phoned her afterwards. I said, "Have you got your thing?" She said, "Darling, whoever you sent to do those things, she'd forgotten it was me. Whoever you sent to bring the things to to me, they are very sensible people." Yeah, because yeah. It my face cream and I yeah. thought that's right they're the things the little things in life that, we, that yeah. are important to us aren't they we've all got yeah. our things that we like to have him you know if we were going away somewhere that I certainly would want my face mm. cream and I need it so she <laughs> she was so happy um yeah. and I think with Jean you know 
she will shout at me for doing something wrong but what she always sees in me is that I'm a kind person mm, she mm. knows that I help her and she will say thank you I couldn't manage without you mm. and I just want to say that um you know throughout this period of Covid we have worked such so closely as a multidisciplinary team to help mm. You know, the care agencies, we've had to have some changes of agencies because she's shouted at people and upset them. Mm. But I've been a consistent person to be able to make sure we get that stability when we change things, hopefully to improve it for G. The mm. doctors have been very involved because we're having to constantly review our medication. The community mental health team for older people are helping with the diagnosis. We've mm got some physical um, disabilities as well. She's now got a demon's leg, so we're having, that's one of the reasons she can't go upstairs. So we have the rapid response nurses who will come out at, at an instant to check on her. The physiotherapists have been involved and the occupational therapy. So it's a big, big team mm -hmm. working mm -hmm. to support her. And I yeah. think that every single one of us comes back to the fundamentals that um, what's important to Jean is manners, kindness, and she will speak as it is. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you treat her well, she, she, she mm -hmm. will, you know, she will be happy with the service she's receiving. And yeah. I just say the whole thing about Jean being a performer, she still believes that she's going to work again and that is so important for her that's mm. her goal in life and I think that what I've done is I've used her past to work towards her future mm. yeah. um, by bringing in all her past skills and recognizing them that's how we've managed to create mm. a bond um, yeah. to work together for her to get the best yeah. outcomes. Wow yeah I mean that is yeah that's that's a uh... That's a, a really kind of uh, a great example of the of the experience of working with people with dementia during the pandemic. And um, I think so much came through from what you were saying there, Vicky. I, I, um, the, the and it's made me think about one of one of the things that we have, one of the barriers that the pandemic has has uh, has created uh, in some ways is that ability to build those relationships. And, yeah. you know, it doesn't matter how complex the diagnosis or how complex the situation is for the individual. Re relationships really is the centre of the work you do with people, isn't it? Your relationship with mm -hmm. that person and and that building that relationship has to be has to be created by a respect for who that individual is and and you know the work we do with people is so sort of personal to them and um uh, uh and especially when you then add in a, a diagnosis of something like dementia where their understanding of things might not be quite what it used to be um sort of really really uh, um getting to grips with the person they are is the and showing them that you've seen that must it seems to be uh, always be uh, the key really to successful work with people so now I'm, I'm really pleased you've you brought that example forward and with Jean what's really important is to see Jean and I and I always say to myself see the me the me in the dementia rather than the dementia mm, yeah absolutely and Thanks. um yeah certainly that that statement of working with someone's um past to work towards their future is uh, is something I'll take away from this and it was a pleasure speaking with you and uh, looking forward to the event Thank you, Vicky and Simon, for those really powerful, inspiring insights. And um, I'm sure that people have some questions for you later that they'd like to pose. So I'd like to introduce you to our second speaker, Jane Knight, who works in a care home, local care home, and will be able to share her experiences of how her and her team have supported people affected by dementia over the last year. Jane. Hello everybody, my name is Jane Knight. I'm one of the two client liaison managers at Cream Hill Manor. We are a residential care home. We're offering nursing, residential and specialist dementia care. Uh, we enjoy a very good reputation in the local area. We are fortunate enough to have an outstanding CQC certificate, which puts us in the top 4% of homes in the country. And we've also achieved beacon status in the gold standards framework which is the highest accolade that you can achieve for end of life care. I personally have been in the care sector for 12 years now, and my role involves uh, uh, taking all of the new inquiries that families make when they're first looking for care for loved ones. It's quite complex. It's a very difficult decision to make. 
sometimes when people come to us in the first instance, they don't even know the questions they ask in order to find out what they need to know. Uh, it's complex because it's discovering what's important to families, what kind of care that they might need, uh, what sort of level of care they may need, um, whether it's nursing or residential or dementia, uh, finding out what uh, they have to support those decisions in terms of the legalities. For example, not everybody knows that having a power of attorney, particularly for families with those living with dementia, is absolutely essential in order for them to be able to act on their loved one's behalf should they lose capacity. Um, sometimes it's about funding, um, sometimes it's about advising people that they might be eligible for attendance allowance through the Department of Work and Pensions website, which is a non-means-tested benefit not a lot of people know about. So it's important to, uh, you know, to be able to give that advice, but also really to get to the heart of what matters to families, finding out about um, their, their loved ones and seeing how best we can support them in every way to live a really happy, supported, safe and fulfilling life uh, here at Coombe Hill Manor. I can only imagine what the home must have gone through um, through last year of 2020. Um, what steps were taken to keep the home safe? Well, firstly, we isolated all of our residents and employed a technique called barrier nursing, which meant that everybody was in their apartments. We're fortunate to have apartments where most of our residents have a separate sitting room, as well as their bedroom, little kitchenette and bathroom. But isolated they were, and uh, barrier nursing means that all three meals a day were taken on trays into residents' rooms, with every member of staff having what we call single-use PPE. So we would put on outside the rooms, mask, gloves, apron, deliver the tray into the room, go into the bathroom, doff the PPE, in other words, take it off, put it into a bag, wash our hands, run downstairs and get the next tray. And we did this three times a day, seven days a week for, gosh, more weeks than I care to remember, month, into months actually, throughout that first lockdown period. That was to keep our residents safe. At that time as well, we were very stretched because a lot of our staff were either living with COVID themselves or they were isolating because family members had COVID. We got um, a lot of people in from our support office to support us as a management team. And also we were multitasking to the max. So my personal experience is that I'm okay on reception now and I'm a dab hand in the laundry. So that's just an example of what we had to do for everybody to pitch in and just really support all of our residents and the home itself. And what were the biggest pressures in particular to begin with um, as you entered into that Covid phase? I think just learning to be adaptable. I mean, just not, uh, you know, sort of worrying about what we had to do, but actually just getting on with it, but also being incredibly adaptable. Uh, at that point, the, the advice and the protocols were changing almost on a daily basis. So you had to learn new, new ways of working, new protocols. Uh, we had risk assessments, risk assessments. Um, not only that, but an immense amount of reporting to do. Uh, trackers to update, NHS capacity tracker, uh, which until recently was updated seven days a week. Um, tracker for how many vaccinations our residents and staff have had. Um, tracker for any infections within the home uh, or, or anything that was uh, pertinent to that. Um, so just an immense amount of reporting, in addition to uh, the daily roles that we all have to occupy to keep the home running uh, successfully and, uh, and anyway. So it was uh, being very adaptable, very agile and um, everybody pitching in to support each other and help themselves to uh, just really be stronger together. And what was the hardest part for the residents and their families, do you believe? I think the isolation, I think not being able to see their families, no, no visitors were permitted, particularly for those residents living with dementia. It's so difficult to explain a pandemic, a virus to somebody and explain why their visitors, their family can't come in and see them anymore. Um, even though we were adaptive and inventive as a lot of homes were with things like window visits, 
For somebody living with dementia, that was possibly even more distressing than not seeing their families at all. I mean, in some instances, families decided that it would be easier not to do the, the Zoom calls, the video calls, the team calls, uh, because it was so difficult to explain why they couldn't come and visit in person. It was actually quite emotionally distressing at times for people. And that was hard to witness. And, um, you know, keeping people's spirits up was was really important. And again, particularly for those people living with dementia, where it's not easy to explain what a global viral pandemic is, um, because it's something that's, to use that very overworked word, unprecedented. None of us have ever lived through this before. So you couldn't even make reference to perhaps uh, historical things that have happened in the past that they could relate to. So that was that was difficult, but we persevered and we uh, we did our very best. That's all you can do. So how did you keep the residents um, stimulated and how did you keep spirits high? It sounds as if uh, that was a real focus point for Coombe Hill Manor. Absolutely, because at the time, of course, one of the things that we're famous for, which is all about our activities and entertainment, couldn't take place anymore. We used to have a huge amount of live music in the home, exercise classes, quizzes, all these sorts of things, none of which we could do. So uh, our activities team had to be incredibly adaptive and inventive. Uh, we invented corridor exercises to keep people you know, on the move, keep their core strength up and everything. So we'd be uh, blasting out music in the corridors and just keeping everybody uh, active and fit as much as we could do. Uh, obviously, uh, the video calls were very important, particularly in dementia as well. It was things like we would do virtual tours to the seaside or out into the countryside. We have a sensory room called the Marjorie, which was developed in association with the University of Stirling. And we can uh, run sort of video clips of exactly things like that, bike rides in the countryside, visits to the seaside. We can run uh, operas, we can run concerts, we can go back in time to somebody's childhood home, um, you know, where somebody was living, uh, who's, who, who was brought up in Canada. We managed to find films where we could go back to that person's original home and just retrace and relive memories, which is so important uh, to, for that reassurance piece for sort of keeping people motivated. And then we did things like film nights with popcorn and hot dogs and lots of lovely snacks and everything. Um, did our own music days, um, flower arranging, everything just to keep people stimulated in a meaningful manner so that they could have a fulfilling day and feel that they've actually achieved something because that feeling of having fun stays with you. Um, even if you don't necessarily remember the activity itself, that warm feeling that you get inside when you've just had a really good time or a jolly good laugh is so uplifting and that's what we're going to do each and every day. So what does the future look like for Coombe Hill Manor, Jane? Well, it's such a relief now to be able to get entertainers back into the building. We've got our two minibuses, we're getting residents out for trips round. Uh, maybe not into galleries and everything just this week or just yet, but out into the countryside, into the parks, Richmond Park, for example, or Wimbledon Common, things like that. That is uplifting in itself. Having that change of scene, very important. Um, the visiting protocols are easing as we follow the government roadmap and things like that. So um, we've got a variety of visiting methods now, whether it's the window visits, in the gazebo, in the garden, we've got a visiting pod, uh, we've got a room set up on the ground floor where now we can have family members coming in and meeting their residents inside, which again is just joyous because they've missed that face-to-face -face contact so much. Um, and with each and every uh, week that goes by, uh, we've got a new visiting guidelines so that uh, families can see their loved ones more regularly. And again, that is just one of the most important steps forward as we ease into the future and June 21 becomes ever closer to us. So we just kind of feel that we've turned that corner now, that things are looking up and we are adapting positively going forward and just really enjoying life now. It's really sort of coming back to normal. 
Thank you so much, Jane. That's really inspiring to hear how people have, um, your team have worked so hard in supporting people and their families living with dementia and, and how creative you've been as well. Thank you. And again, I'm sure people will have questions to pose to you later on. So moving on to our last but not least speakers are our student nurses who will be able to share their experiences and key learning over the last year. Hi, I'm, I'm Michelle. I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Nursing and I'm joined by three of our final year student nurses. And as part of Dementia Awareness Week, I'm intrigued to know how COVID has affected nursing individuals who are affected by dementia. So Catherine, can you tell us about your reflections from this past year about your interactions with people who have dementia? Yeah, um, there was one particular um, uh, story that I can remember which from last year, um, uh, an old lady was brought in uh, by her daughter and um, she had uh, mild uh, dementia. Um, was a little bit confused. Obviously, she was unwell as well. Um, the daughter was quite um, uh, apprehensive about leaving her, but tried to assure her as much as we possibly could that we would give her the best possible care while she was there. Um, but also because this lady, unfortunately, was hard of hearing as well. So because we were wearing masks and she was wearing a mask, everything mm. became more muffled. Um, and um, so we took the decision to uh, when we were interacting with her to use a clear mask so that then she could still lip read um, and that made a world of difference and actually you could see it alleviated some of her anxiety actually while she was oh. in there. Well thank you that's um, yeah I can imagine how you know face coverings mask wearing actually can make it um, make make us look quite frightening especially for people who have got that sort of um, uh, difficulty with cognition and understanding um, the, 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 the context of, of um, the environment that they're in. So yeah that's that's really good thank you. Um, Kat what about yourself? How what's 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 it been like for you and and have you nursed anybody or families uh, come across families who are affected by dementia? Yeah, so I, um, right, right at the very, very start of the outbreak actually, um, was looking after an elderly lady with dementia who was actually end of life. Um, mm. And she didn't understand why her family weren't allowed to come in and see her. And she obviously missed her family terribly. Um, and my one of my jobs was to pass messages from the family to her and 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 back again um she had been uh, she she was end of life um she had hours if not days to to live um it was almost like she seemed to sort of rally the the day before she died it was it was almost like she seemed to rally and she asked me to pass a message to her family telling them that she loved them and that she couldn't wait to hug them all again and see them all again and that to me was was pretty heartbreaking because obviously we, we knew what the situation was but she wasn't fully aware um, as it transpired she did uh, she, she died the next day but um mm passing passing that particular message to her family was was quite a difficult one but in the same breath you know you can't um you can't lie or mislead or anything mm -hmm. like that so mm -hmm. best thing was to just pass it yeah. as she said it so and yeah. and was it because sorry was it because of covid then the pandemic that they were not able to be yeah together yeah. so they they were at the time the trust I was working within um, had a blanket ban on visits 
um, no matter what the situation was, there were no special allowances oh, being made. Wow. Um, the the family okay. was not allowed inside um, and having to sort of leave work at the end of the shift and see the family in the car park bawling their eyes out because they can't see their loved one. Um, and within that, being unable to go and console the family in any way, like you can't touch, you can't hug, which to me personally, and I'm sure to many other nurses would be second nature to go and give the family a hug and to console. We weren't allowed to do that. Um, and I think for me personally, that was the toughest part about caring for people within, like during this pandemic, um, mm -hmm. wow. being able, not being able to do that most basic thing of, of giving someone yeah. a bit of physical comfort. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Wow, that's that's really tough. And I'm sure many, many people listening um, will, will um, resonate with that whether whether you're um, a nurse or not that the, the absence of physical physical touch and of being able to be in the same um, um, presence as other people has been obviously um, something that we've all been denied of during this um, pandemic thank you for sharing that that's really powerful um, Ellie coming to you what what are, what are your reflections for this past year? Uh, well, I think it's been quite a frightening time for um, patients mm. with dementia because they um, they're not allowed to see their families. The families aren't allowed to come in and visit them, whether that be in a hospital or whether it's in the community setting. Uh, last year, I was in, on a community placement, and the the homes just had a, a ban on. Um, having family members in like their recreational areas mm. or part of the, the home at all. So um, they were literally just looking at each other through the window with the window slightly open so they could hear each other. Uh, and, that, and that's um, it's an awful thing to happen even if you don't have dementia, but even mm. so when you do because you think well why can't I see them why can't I touch them because they might not necessarily know that there's a pandemic going on so um and then also mm. everyone wearing masks they're like well why are you all wearing masks what's going on mm. uh, and so having to try mm. and explain to them what's going on in the the wider world and um and then within five minutes they've forgotten again so you have to explain it all over again and it's just being patient and and taken the time to explain it all over again so you're right that it's um you know when when memory is is a difficult uh, uh, is difficult then to to be wondering why you can't see um a relative um why people are wearing um gloves and aprons and face coverings all the time it must be um yeah really really frightening and quite difficult being being a, a a a nurse or a student nurse in this time so um i guess it would be good um because you're third year students um to hear what would be your one just one quick top tip to anybody who's listening whether they're um a student of social work or a nursing student or a member of the public who who are listening to this video what would be your top tip to those who are listening about about dementia and from what you've you know from your experiences what you've learned um mine would definitely be uh to uh listen um definitely mm. key thing is to is to listen um not cajole um and um you know to reminisce with with that person um the stories that they can tell are absolutely amazing and if you've got mm. the chance to listen then listening is very important um also if you uh, go onto the dementia friends website there's a wealth of information out there um if people want to know a little bit more thank you and kat um i would say patience be patient mm. with them. Um, this may be the fifth, sixth or even the tenth time that they've told you this story, but for them it's the first time and for them this story is important. That's why they want you to know. So be patient and be kind with them um, 
And as as Catherine quite correctly said, sometimes you can listen to the best stories over and over again. And it's absolutely fantastic. And you can pick up little tricks and tips and hints on on how best to help them, um, particularly if they get agitated, de-escalating a situation. Take the time to find out about the person. That's that's the top thing, because, you know, they had a life before um, dementia took hold of them and if you especially as a student take the time to listen find out what they did what they got up to as a teenager you know say come on tell us some stories and they love to talk you know and that reminiscing with them especially mm -hmm. when you're a student because you've got the time to do it when you're qualified mm -hmm. you may not have that time um, and so if you've got the chance to do it while you're a student, then grab it with both hands because there are some amazing things, you know. Mm. Um, and one example was when I was on placement, there was a chap who was a, a engineer, design engineer, and he was wanting to go off somewhere, but I distracted him by saying, come on, design me something. So I gave him his bedside table and some whiteboard markers and said, design me something. And he spent a couple of hours just drawing designs and explaining to them and his whole personality just lit up, you mm. know, because he was doing, he was talking about something that he loved and it was fantastic mm. to see. In summing up what you basically said, top tips are, you know, time, patience and person know the person not just the condition and how it's affected that that individual but know the person behind the condition thank you so much to our speakers who've contributed um, and shared their really inspiring stories of how they've worked through the pandemic to support people affected by dementia so we've got a, a number of questions in the chat and What's come up um, perhaps for our student nurses who, who may like to ask, there's a question really asking about how you manage your kind of emotional resilience. So just sharing some of the powerful stories that you have supporting people at the end of life. What's helped you actually get through this period? Wondering if one of our students would like to answer that. Uh, yeah, I think just having a good support network um, talking about it with your supervisors on placement um, and with um, fellow student nurses if you've got a, a little WhatsApp group going on um, with maybe three or four of your friends who are nursing students who will understand what you're going through um, and will listen to you rant and rave and cry and you know and, and say okay that's done you know time to move on and so it, it's good to have a support network. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and, and again, I'm just wondering if any other student nurses wanted to comment on that, what's helped them get through this last year in terms of their own emotional resilience or particular support that they'd be able to share with fellow students? Yeah, I think definitely, as Ellie said, have, if you if it's possible, have that sort of close knit group we've got sort of three or four other people i know certainly ellie and myself and a handful of others have supported each other uh on numerous occasions there's been numerous occasions where you feel unable to talk maybe to another friend or to a family member because with the best will in the world it's it sometimes takes someone else in the same position to be able to understand your feelings on 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 everything basically Thank you. And also just echoing really the support that's available in the university for our for our students here at Kingston and St George's and to encourage our students to, to access that support as well, as well as the national helplines that we'll be signposting for you too. Just on that theme, Jane, I wondered there was a question about uh, the excellent work that you've done supporting the residents, but also we know how difficult it's been for for health and social care staff during this period and and how you found your own support as well obviously but how the care staff have managed and and how they've been supported through this period well i i, I think i can only reiterate what uh, what's already been said it's pulling together it's having those conversations with people that are going through exactly the same experiences that you've been through um you know really having that trust and support going up into 
while to uh, just share silly um, have the experience that you share with each other and having that mutual support. Thank you. Um, other questions that have been posed was just questions on if some of the wider community were concerned about somebody who may be they think may be affected by dementia. What's the kind of process for assessment really? How they would go about having somebody assessed and, and how long that might be to, to happen? And I'm wondering, uh, I'm not sure, Vicky, from a kind of adult social services, is there a particular approach that people could contact to, to explore that? What would your advice be? Um, well, we would say to um, phone in to Kingston Council to the access team and then um, you would be um, allocated somebody to do an assessment with you to a Care Act assessment to assess if you had eligible needs under the Care Act. And through that, we then work with our um, multidisciplinary team colleagues so we can ask the GP to look at getting um, an assessment for a memory assessment through the memory clinics. And it can take a while to, to go through that process um, but we'll be there to support you. Thank you. I mean, I'm just wondering, do, do people feel that obviously with COVID-19 that there's been such a demand on services? Paula, you were mentioning earlier how that's impacted. Just wondering your experience, do you feel that that's kind of been a, a barrier perhaps for people in terms of accessing services over the last year? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a lot of issues there. I think partly, you know, services have been reduced. So I, you know, believe the memory service weren't carrying out assessments for a, for a short period of time. But also, people are are very were very concerned about accessing help, um, and so that itself will have caused a delay. Um, and just generally, sort of, even aside from living through a pandemic, we know that people are often living with symptoms of dementia for quite some time before um, they seek help, before they talk to their doctor, before those referrals get made either for help from social services or from the memory assessment to get um, to get a, a proper diagnosis. So we, you know, we know that even at that point that people get help, quite often they've been, you know, struggling on their own or with, you know, family carers for some time before then. Thank you. Um, I'm also interested, as, as well as looking at the challenges of the last year, um, what, what do you think some of the strengths were if we look as a, as a community and partnership working? Just opening that out, really, what your thoughts were about what we can learn about working together more positively going forward? Has any of the panel got some thoughts on that, some examples of what's worked well and what we can draw on going forward? Thinking from a dementia friendly communities perspective um, and I started in this role just just before the pandemic started so you know I kind of hadn't really got up and running with with my community or getting to you know got to know the whole of the community and so I started having um, online um, community meetings um, and of course that's quite different to what might normally have happened in you know in normal times with how the the focus of our work might have gone but actually I think it gave us something different because what we started it started off really as a support system for all of our organizations to just kind of debrief a bit talk about um, what's been going on what some of the challenges kind of being able to share that we've got a few care homes who are part of the community um, you know kind of different services and so on um, and actually I think in a sense we got to know each other better and got to know our organizations better we were able to meet more frequently because we were meeting online um, and kind of different things came to the forefront. So I know that Maria, you, you know, we've been in discussions with uh, with Jane and we've been looking at actually how can, you know, we're putting together a research project, you know, around capturing some of these experiences around the pandemic. And that's something that potentially wouldn't have ever happened if you, we hadn't been listening to some of those conversations and, and listening to the staff sharing um, sharing their experiences. Um, I was at, a, at one of our meetings, one of our services team was there talking about a particular client who was having difficulty um, getting a new television. 
um, and suddenly people from um, somebody from a care home, somebody from a care agency, were, you know, I had people offering to fund it, people offering to give him information, people offering, you know, who had contacts to go and install it, you know, all kind of people who were kind of, you know, safe and, you know, this is all sort of going, you know, with links through social services as well. But I think all these sorts of opportunities just wouldn't have come up under, you know, kind of normal non-COVID times. Um, so I think there's been kind of opportunities for different things. And, and I think the biggest thing is actually about getting to know each other and being able to support each other more. Thank you, Paul. It's really it's really good to hear those kind of positive connections, really, that have come out of the last year. Um, so I think some of the central messages and reflections really from the speakers, and thank you all so much, is, is actually those key messages of seeing the person. And, and not the condition and, and understanding that person's history and working with them in a in a person centred way, being kind and, and keeping those connections really with people that we're working with and that joint working, um, the commitment for, from all of our speakers and the services is really um, that strong commitment to supporting people and their families affected by dementia. So um, thank you for your contributions. I just wanted to remind everyone who's joined us, I know people may have joined us a little bit later on, that we are going to move on now to, um, in a second, to a, a moment of reflection that, that will be led by Hamad, our um, spiritual faith leader here at Kingston and St George's University, just to have a moment of reflection. After that, we're going to be introducing you to Belinda, and the theatre company who'll be sharing their play via a film, Grandma Remember Me, a really powerful and inspiring play that explores the impact of dementia on a family. So I hope you're going to be able to stay for this afternoon to watch that. And we will also have a live question and answer session um, with the cast who have all got personal experience of dementia. So thank you so much to our speakers and I hope you're going to stay with us for the afternoon. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Hamad um, for a moment of reflection. Thank you. As 2020 started, the world faced the threat of a totally new virus, COVID-19. As we all navigated completely new, different and difficult challenges in our working and personal lives, many of Kingston universities and community were at the forefront of the government, scientific, public and university response. We know many of us have been impacted and affected by both COVID-19 and also dementia over the last year. At this crucial moment, it is important to spend a few moments on personal reflection for us to recognise the impact of COVID on our community over the last year the loss in our community, but also to recognise the strength and support we can offer each other now and going forward. This has been undoubtedly an extremely difficult year for everyone, and we have all certainly been affected in some way by the impact of COVID. Although those living with dementia and their families have been significantly affected in terms of losing loved ones, not being able to be there with them at their time of need, to visit them and to support them and at the end of their life. Many have been sadly denied the opportunity to come together to celebrate that person's life as they would have wanted to. And as we move on to a brighter future, we wanted to take a moment as a university, as a local community here in Kingston and the wider community that have joined us today to have a moment of re reflection, to recognise this loss, to come together, to have a minute of remembrance and reflection. COVID-19 has taught us to prioritise and think about what our blessings actually are, what we actually want to keep with us, what will transpire into something meaningful for us going forward. It's now a time it's a time to think deeply about the life we want to live and the impact we want to leave behind. Because change starts not just with you, but with a particular, with a very particular part of you, your heart. And if your heart is good, the entire body becomes good and the rest of your actions follow suit. 
you then bring into your home, into your household, and then you have societal change. It comes from a family because a community is made of several families. And if you think about the most transformative communities in history, that transformation was started by just one or two families who got together and started to build something and impact and affect change in their society. You have to think of your heart as your spiritual reservoir that you feed. And with that reservoir, you can give to the rest of the world. And as students, professionals, carers, family members, this year has shown us the amazing strength that we have galvanized to work together, to support one another, to give strength, kindness and understanding. This was evident by the millions of volunteers that came forward at the start of this tragic pandemic to help support amazing initiatives across the country. This was also evident at Kingston, whether it was the self-isolation support center that was set up to support our students, to the successful and ongoing vaccination campaign, to the food banks and hardship funds. It has brought into focus how important the work is of the caring professionals and part of this event is to share that learning, to build on that strength, to support and learn from each other as we go forward into a brighter place, into a brighter future. Thank you for participating in moments of reflection. Thank you so much, Hamad, for um, that really thoughtful and inspiring and really moving moment of reflection. And I think it was really important for us just to take that time to, to have that reflection and also draw on the positives, as you've highlighted, moving forward as a community. Um, so we're now going to be moving on to introduce Belinda from the Theatre Company. Um, that will be showing Grandma Remember Me. So we've worked with Belinda for a number of years now um, and I'm so excited about sharing the performance with you. But first of all, I wanted to introduce you to Belinda so she can tell you more about the play and, and what's driven herself and the theatre company to develop this. Belinda, lovely to have you with us today and we're really excited about looking at the play later on. <laughs> I, hope, I hope you're well. Good, yes, very well. Good to be here. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more, Belinda, about the, the play. What, what was your inspiration for developing the play? Do you know what? This is a long story. I'll try and keep it short. <laughs> um, it began really because as an actor, I've been acting for about 20 20 etc years and I moved down to Cornwall and uh, um, I just was driving up the M5 the M1 every day you know when every other day seeing for auditions and work and I, I decided I wanted to create something of my own and they say write about what you know now for me my, my grandma was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and, um, and my mum uh, she developed Alzheimer's so we lived with with dementia for so many, so many years. And I suppose looking back now, um, everything that I learned about dementia prior to developing the play was learned the hard way. Um, so the first draft of the script that you're going to see this afternoon was a lot harsher than the one you're going to see. And I remember um, taking the script down to uh, a colleague in Colm where I live and she worked for a company called Arts for Health at the time and uh, she read the script and she said hmm it's a bit it's a bit hard hitting and I said it's all true and she said to me have you ever heard the expression living well with dementia now to me uh, I had not heard that phrase and, and it was something completely outside of my experience. 
Now, I remember having some funny moments, but there was an awful lot of challenges and a lot, a lot of um, hardships, I think. And and then she said to me, have you ever been to a, a memory cafe? And I said, <laughs> I don't know what they are. And um, bear in mind, I'm just trying to think, this is about eight years ago now, um, when I first started to develop grandma. And, and then I said, I don't know what they are. And she said, have you heard of these other organisations out there? And then uh, Jane, she was called Jane Howard, lovely lady. Then she reeled off this whole list of like dancing for dementia, poetry for dementia, walking in the cook. It was just this plethora of activities, arts based activities and also physical and community that was out there of which I knew nothing about. And, and, and I it just this light bulb went off inside my head and I thought if I don't know this stuff is out there um, there'll be thousands out there who don't know either so I so um, and also at the same time around this same time I come across some research uh, by uh, Oxford University it was and they'd explored the relationship between um, the grandparent who has dementia with the grandchild and what this uh, literature was saying was that it was so important to maintain this really precious relationship throughout the journey of dementia and so those two things sort of connected at the same time and I thought right I'm, I'm going back to the drawing board so I went back at the script and I and I, and, and I rewrote it and in, in, the, in that meantime, I, I, I'd find a local memory cafe down here where I live and I, I joined in and I found singing for the brain and I joined in and I joined in did a lot of activities. I researched so much and I wanted to put some of those positive messages in the play. And at the same time, I also wanted us to explore um, the importance of this this relationship between the grandparent and the grandchild because at that time, again, things have changed massively, haven't they, over these last eight years? At that time, there was literature to support families in terms of for the person who had dementia and there was some literature around um, supporting carers. But I, I didn't see much at all about the importance of, you know, under, so how do you how do you explain um, dementia to, to children? So in a sense, that was my angle in terms of how I was going to approach the play in a different way. So the play that people are going to see this afternoon at, at two o'clock um, there are three characters in it. So we've got the grandchild's perspective. We've got the grandparent, um, grandma who has dementia, who we see developing dementia. And then we also have uh, the father, single, a single um, male ca carer father, <laughs> uh, who is the carer. So we, the idea we see these three different perspectives. So for me, um, that's when the play came alive. And I always am uh, very passionate about um, evaluations and making sure the work works. And so in the first development, we actually did a, a showcase to different organisations. Um, the first place this play was performed, and there it is a, a theatre piece, it's a theatre piece primarily, and it's been filmed because of COVID. Um, it, it was shown in a primary school in Myla Bridge where I live. And the first ever response from a child in a Q&A was a little girl and she must have been about, I think she was probably about um, seven or eight, something like that. And she said, she said in the, you know, the Q&A, she said, I wish my mum had seen this play. Maybe then she'd have let me see my grandma. And I don't know about everybody else out there, but you know, there's moments in your life where you, you, your back tingles and you kind of go, Poor. And I remember chewing my cheek inside and smiling, pretending I didn't want her to see my feelings really, because I was it just so deeply moved me because I thought, yeah, we're on the right track here. And we've been touring the play up to well, pre-COVID um, every year, you know, for about sort of six, seven weeks a year. And over the years, we found out so many parents stop their children from seeing their grandparents because they're trying to protect them. And, and as, 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 as important as it is for parents, it's, you know, it's our jobs to protect our children, but actually more importantly, we need to um, teach them um, resilience, help them find their own resilience. And actually a young child can understand um, 
that grandma's different or granddad's different. And with your help and support, you can work out a, a way of being together. And so um, that first comment was right, we're on the right track. And also at the same time, I'd, I'd invited a, a number of health professionals down to see uh, our first showcase. And a lady who, um, Kate Mitchell, who was at the time, she was our dementia lead in Cornwall. She said this could be used as a, like a training vehicle. There's a different way to train. And so to cut a long story short, it kind of took off that way. So now the play is used as a like a creative, entertaining way to train around dementia, as it were. And the beauty of it is it, it it doesn't matter in a sense where you are on the scale of dementia um, experience. So for someone who really has such a lot of experience, we we'll may see this play and think this is a real uh, sort of a, a real nice gentle introduction to dementia. And that was a quote we had for one person. And then for somebody else on the opposite scale, it's, oh, that was really hard. <laughs> I didn't know it was like that. So we think we've sort of struck the mid balance there somewhere. So that was kind of that's really kind of what's happened. And then um, I think it's in 2014. We, we had a long tour then just after the tour, my mom died and the, I don't want to say, say too much because some of these questions may come out after the Q&A, but my 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 mum, because of a series of uh, things that happened, non-protocol non uh, events, I suppose, that happened, my mum had to have an autopsy. And we found out that actually my mum had been misdiagnosed. She actually had, uh, she, she actually had 2% Alzheimer's and it, she actually had Lewy bodies dementia and it's like now at the time I didn't even know what that was now I, I am really up to speed on that and in hindsight I look back at those behaviors and say for example in, in my mom's care home she kept banging into things and falling over now I now know that is a classic um sort of um way it can be expressed in terms of your the uh, your, your, your your sort of spatial capacity is impacted and you don't you don't navigate physically the world the same so people do with Lewy bodies bang into things and they, they do fall over but at the time they thought they, they, they thought it was their eyesight and so they tried to put these thick sort of elasticated glasses on her and she hated them and she was still falling over and she was still banging into things and it was interesting because again, it, it fought, tried to drive um, what we're trying to achieve home to raise awareness and understanding. It was uh, evident to me that some 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 people didn't have training. I mean, this is a you know what you're doing here at, at Kingston and and the sort of reaching out to the wider community and the training you're doing is absolutely amazing. A bit, and it's so much better now than it used to be. But there are still some places where it's not, you know, like it, it really needs to help. And so that has impacted and that then created a second play. Um, what do you see, which we uh, tour as well. Um, so there, yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> so you asked me a question, Marie, and I go on for half an hour. <laughs> it's always it's always a pleasure to talk to you, Belinda, and, you, and, and you're so passionate and bring it all to life. And I think it's um, really important for us and an audience as well to, to kind of hear the, the context really and the motivation for the play um, and it's really inspiring that the work that you've done. So we're going to start to play um, the, the play shortly um, but it would be great to have you and the cast afterwards for that Q&A because I'm sure the, the play will generate lots of questions. So an absolute pleasure to have you with us today, Belinda. Thank and I'm, you. we're going to start to to, to uh, play the actual Grandma Remember Me now, and then we'll have the Q&A for everyone after the event. So I'm sure people will really enjoy it. Thank you. This is my treasure box. It's full of memories that make me smile. And this is my grandma. She was the show girl. With she was the best grandma in the world. So I get here, Grandma, no kitty with me. Get away, that's your age. <laughs> Honestly, as I collected lots of memories, my grandma lost more and more of hers. Oh, sorry, sorry. My old grandma, she just disappeared. Inside this new one, 
that I didn't know or understand. Grandma? Yes? Why are you giving Shandy tomato ketchup? <laughs> and get off, you daft dog. That is not for you. Shoo, go on, shoo, go on. Sometimes she talk to these invisible people. What's wrong with me, Lily? You've got the houses. Remember? Your brain's a bit different to what it was, that's all. I am all. I was with that one. With the little one. Lily. Shandy. With the Lily and the Shandy. And the toot toot! The boop, the boop, the boop. She wasn't really talking anymore, though. It was more like gibberish. And then the boy goes, oh, put down, up, down, up, down. Sometimes they'd make her really happy. That's Georgie. Yeah. <laughs> and other times they'd really upset her. I don't know why. Oh, yeah, no. You know how I'm always going on about how important it is to remember things? Mm -hmm. Well, why don't you put together a memory box full of photos and things that remind you of all the good times you've had with Grandma? Oh, I could put in all those pictures that I've been drawing for her. <laughs> and that whistle you gave her, that really helped her for a while. Oh, oh Dad, <laughs> and Michelle necklace, that could go in there as well. And then, every time you look inside, all those happy feelings will come flooding back. Dad was right. It is important to remember. In case you feel sad. And it's especially important to remember people who don't know how to remember you. Thank you so much, Belinda and, and the cast, for such a powerful play. I've seen that play probably four times and it, it really moves me every time. Um, it explores such a difficult topic so sensitively and powerfully, so thank you for that. Um, I just wondered if anybody, I'm just seeing if anybody has any questions to put in the chat to you. Uh, I think people have found it um, really valuable and it, it struck memories. I think what's so emotive about the play is that many of us have been affected personally by dementia and, and they can see some of those behaviours as well. So before we start the discussion, I just also wanted to highlight to people to make sure that they get access to the helplines that we posted earlier to talk through some of these emotions that I'm sure that this has raised for you. Belinda, thanks again. Um, I just wondered, and I know, and thanks, is Claire with us as well today? When I was invited um, into the company, um, the, the timing was, was very strange, actually. Um, it, I read the script um, uh, that Belinda wrote, and um, a lot of the script really reminded me of my dad um, and how he was changing. So really my involvement with the play has really, really seen me through um, the journey of dementia with my dad. Um, so we, we've been touring this, um, you know, for, for a while now um, as a company, um, uh, not all the time <laughs> and certainly not this year, but we get together a couple of months a year. Um, and each year, you know, there's been a um, obviously a change with my dad. And then um, so, to kind of fast forward a little bit, uh, even though we knew something was wrong with him, we didn't get his diagnosis um, as soon as possibly we could have done, because when he went on the medication, I'm aware that he, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. Um, things started to plateau and he plateaued, he stayed on this kind of plateau for a while. So this was seven years ago. Um, but then it's quite, it's such a insidious disease. You don't see, we didn't certainly with my dad's diagnosis, we didn't see major changes quickly. But when I think about my dad and what happened to him and the, the shell he became towards the end, it was very, very slow. And my mum was looking after him. She was his main carer. Um, and I, I definitely want to mention this. My dad passed away two years ago. Um, and at the time that my dad passed away, my mum got really ill and um, the stress of looking after him had taken its toll. And again, there's these things that we don't see. And as a family member and being someone actively involved in uh, dementia care, 
we didn't notice that my mum wasn't well, she wasn't sleeping, she wasn't getting anywhere near enough sleep. Um, her nervous system was on high alert a lot of the time. Um, and what started off as a, a, a cold that turned into an infection, that turned into pneumonia, that turned into sepsis, that turned into a stroke, she suddenly overnight got very ill. Um, so I do definitely want to just mention, you know, the carers as well, just from, from personal experience. Um, I know what I've learned in terms of what happened to my dad, even though, and it, it kind of grew thicker, the shell, hard, a bit harder, the shell. I knew my dad was in there and sometimes I'd, I'd see him. I just know, I'd, and, and this is all on reflection now after what happened, I never stopped showing him I loved him as much as, I could possibly love him because I had a feeling that that was still getting through and I know that even the context might drop away um, that he could feel feelings um, and I feel that quite strongly that he, he did you know so yeah that kind of nurturing and soothing element trying to soothe his anxiety putting myself in his shoes um, and trying to make him feel good um, so yeah, that that's kind of been my experience as a daughter, and and doing the play, funnily enough, totally in parallel <laughs> with my dad's journey has been been quite something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Claire, for for sharing your experiences. Um, and I know from because we've met before, it's quite interesting, Belinda and Claire, because you've had different experiences, haven't you, with your own. Um, family members um, affected by dementia mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if you could share some of the positive messages or, or perhaps the, the learning really from your exp experiences. We've got a range of the community, students, professionals attending today. Perhaps with you to Belinda, what would be your key messages really from your experience? Well, Again, um, I've learned this, uh, my learning a lot has been in insight and actually touring the play, talking to professionals as such as yourself, uh, thousands of carers over the years and, and, and students. I think that the, the, the most important thing I would say, because I know, I think I know what Claire's going to say, so I won't say that one, <laughs> um, is to think of the the person behind the disease in that if anybody with dementia is ever showing distressed behavior be it anger fear uh, upset in any way it's because there is a need that is not being met and that can either be uh, something painful uh, an example of i remember being at a conference once actually it was, it was a it was a quite quite a quite a nice function and sat next to this gentleman and he was he kind of, I don't know the, the exact job title, but he's, he was like a, he classed himself as a troubleshooter. He was, he was asked to go into care homes to uh, address and work out what, uh, some of the, what the challenging behaviour was. And he said that he'd been invited to this particular care home. They'd said to him, um, what is your, um, what, what's wrong with it? There's this gentleman, he's not eating and he's getting very angry. And every time we try to feed him, he hits the spoon and throws the, the spoon away. And so I, he said, he said to me, I said, the first thing I said, have you checked his teeth? Have you checked his mouth? And he had a, he had a, a big ulcer. And it's like, wouldn't anybody, if, somebody was, if you had a bit of ulcer and someone was trying to feed you, wouldn't you get a bit distressed? And it's so that there's either something medical, medical going on or there is something like, there's a, it's, there's something else going on and this is why I think the most important thing outside of that is um, understanding the person behind the disease. Once you know that person uh, you and you get to understand the behaviours and sometimes that those behaviours can be quite clear and sometimes you need a bit of an investigation and so um, I give a, 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 an example that I was given, well we were as a team given earlier on through a and a an example would be this lady um, wouldn't get into the bath and uh, when the staff tried to get her into the bath in the care home she would punch them and get quite aggressive. Now this care home was amazing, they, they understood there's a reason for it and they did some investigative work 
And um, for, for those people of, in, in this audience now from my generation and above, when we were younger, we used to have to share the bath water, didn't we? The, there was only a, a certain amount of water available and, and all the family had to use it. Now, in her family, it turned out, they told us, there was a strict pecking order and dad used to get in first, then it was her mum, then her big sister got in and she was always last. And so they tried something. Next time she tried to, you know, they tried to bath and she was getting very agitated. They actually said to her, your dad's been in, your mum doesn't want one and uh, we don't know where your sister is. And she, apparently this is what they said to us. She just went, oh, OK. And she went straight to the bath, really, you know, with no problem at all. Now, I'm not saying that would work all the time, but what I'm saying is those staff, they were curious. They knew there was something else going on and they tried something. And... Um, and I think that curiosity and understanding there's a whole history of that person happened before they met you and and that can really impact on um, on us and our behavior. You know, sorry, on their, on their us understanding their behavior, should I say. What your third thoughts were really in terms of key learning messages, given your experiences? Yeah. Um... Again, I, I guess that when I was doing things at the time, I didn't really, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I guess I just knew that if I, because I'd often walk in um, to, to tension actually with my mum and dad, you know, when I, I'd go and visit, um, nerves were definitely frayed. Um, and yeah, I, I, I realise now, you know, how, how kind of tense my mum was and it's literally taken over a year for her to start to unravel and you know I mean this this has this is maybe personal but you know I know that um it took her a long time to to miss my dad actually after he died and that was really hard for me as as I thought god what's happened here with this relationship but it had got it had, it was difficult it was hard very hard for her um so when I I, I used to go in and try and soothe things now I realise so that that word was quite important I realised what I was doing now I used to go and kind of brace myself to really try and make my dad feel good there was something that we we um heard about when we were touring um, we often get um things fed back to us you know in the Q&As and then um, and there was some research done about if you're able to make that person with dementia feel good, that feeling can last inside for up to three days. Um, so even if the connection has maybe um, been lost or is drifting, um, still being able to kind of try and reach my dad. So um, yeah, there was definitely like a, a bit of a, a nurturing element. I'd really try and never uh, rush out because I, I knew that he'd be left with that feeling as well but not be able to understand it um, and that home life environment for my mum and dad was, was difficult so I used to um, and again personal but I, we didn't realise how bad my mum was you know until it, it really did reach you know this emergency situation um, so yeah I mean my dad it was very very kind of um, very slow the disease very slow this you know the his progression with it um but certainly through it i just tried to carry on loving him as much as possible and i'm so glad as well i'm so glad that that kind of saw me through because you don't know when you know the last time is that you're gonna see your loved ones you don't my dad was taken really quickly in the end um we'd had to take him he ended up in a care home um um, my mum was in hospital for quite a while and my dad went into a care home um, and thank, you know the people that we came across with were kind you know and this word kindness I know that I was kind of trying to be as kind as humanly possible to my dad but we received that back as well because we were really floundering at that point me and my sister um, so yeah um, and the last time um, I saw my dad actually he he wasn't speaking very much and this connection that can be, and you saw it in the play, you know, he, um, grandma doesn't recognise Lily and there were times like towards the end, my dad didn't know who me and my sister were, but he knew that we made him feel good and that was important. So even if the context is gone, the feelings haven't. Um, and the last time I saw my dad, he said, he said to me, 
you'll come back, won't you? <laughs> Thank, you know, yes, <laughs> you know, managed to, yeah, fill that last visit with love. Not that I knew it was the last visit and you don't often. <laughs> so that helped me, that helped me definitely. Um, yeah, so um, that's just as a daughter, you know, these feelings are remembered even if the subject is lost. Yeah. Thank you so much, Claire, for, for oh, sharing. That's OK, because uh, it's re it's real. You know, it's like we've had this come up at, in, in Q&A's. People have said, what's the point in me visiting if they don't know who I am? Well, th this this is the point, actually. You know, don't rush out. Let them, th th you know, they'll, they'll have that feeling still, but not be able to understand why. And just, you know, keep let's keep putting ourselves in those people's shoes where it must feel so anxious, you know, not knowing what's going on and not being able to quite have a grasp of things. So, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Maria. <laughs> Thank you. And I think it raises a really important point that the person will really hold on to those positive emotions and the feelings of, of loved one being with them, even though they may well forget the events of the day. So thanks again to you both, Belinda and Claire. How Claire describes it is really beautiful. This whole thing about as well, if you don't know what to do, just be kind. That just that's just really so important. And knowledge, all this, this the importance of knowledge. I look back at, at my mum and one, one thing I forgot to say when I was introducing earlier on is as when mum had the autopsy was she also had actually had cancer and that hadn't been picked up. So some of her distressed behaviour might have been, well, I'm, I'm presuming was that particular to a, down to a lower back. And so the, 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 the more knowledge that you have about the different types of dementia, the more understanding and, and kindness, patience and being able to have time. And, and I also think equally it is so important that management really invest in their staff in terms of training, in terms of um, creating, you know, a framework where there, there is space and time um, and curiosity, you know. Thank you, Belinda. We've got a number of um, lots of wonderful positive feedback in our chat about how people have experienced the place. So a huge thank you. Um, and also people asking when they can get access to the play, when they can see it. But when we send out the link to the recording, your details will be on there and people can contact you directly to find out about how they can work with you perhaps to access the play. Um, and also the other plays that you're looking at providing. And I know you're developing a range of, of, of other plays, aren't you? And it's such a moving way uh, to learn. So thank you again <laughs> to the, to the theatre company. Um, it's been a fantastic afternoon. Um, and I know that all of us collectively, we've got about 600 people enrolled and just a huge heartfelt thanks for your performance and, and being so open about your personal experiences, which have been really inspiring. Um, I also wanted to highlight again to everyone the helplines to make sure that you're accessing support as well. So just before we bring things to a close, I just wanted to introduce Jane Lindsay, our Associate Dean of Teaching and Learning. And Jane has been abs absolutely instrumental in supporting us over the last few years in promoting the event and working with Belinda and her theatre company. So Jane, welcome to the event. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. I think like I think I probably speak for everyone to, uh, in saying what an amazing day this has been. So powerful. We're all going to have much to take away from it. Key words, knowledge, kindness, friend, being a friend and um, how important all of those elements are. This event is a commitment of the faculty to provide a cross faculty teaching and learning experience for our students and staff in health and social care in particular. So it's, it's sponsored and supported by the faculty in on that basis, because we one of the things we've heard about today is how people work as a team. We heard about the OT, occupational therapist. <laughs> um, we heard about nurses. We heard about social workers and all the work, and the careful managers, all the work that people do together to support people and to support families. How important that is. I have a number of people to thank, and I'd like to. I'm kind of doing a bit in reverse order. So Belinda, 
Claire and John, thank you so much for the play. I, like Maria, have seen it a number of times. It never fails to be fresh and um, that you take something more from it each time. I know that in delivering such a play, you have to give so much of yourselves and particularly because this is part of your lived experience. So thank you for that fresh, wonderful performance, both in watching the video, but also in how you spoke about it today. Paula, Vicky, Simon, Jane, thank you so much for your contribution at the beginning of the day. It was great hearing about real work and the kind of things that people were doing. Terrific. A special thanks to Michelle, Catherine, Ellie and Kat. Fantastic to hear our students um, and our nursing colleagues. Um, thank you so much for that a very powerful input as well. I personally find Hamad's um, address so helpful in helping us think about our good hearts. And, and creating that moment of reflection, I thought was amazing. Thank you, Hamid, thank you so much for those very well chosen words. I also want to thank everybody who's attended. Thank you all very much for being here and being with us. But I have very special thanks for Anastasia and for Maria, who have worked on this for weeks and weeks. And thank you so much for making it come together this year. It was a hard year to do because of we're in these post-COVID, nearly post-COVID times, I'm hoping post-COVID, um, but working towards post-COVID times, but it's been amazing. I think actually it's probably been helpful to have um, to have it online because I think so, in some ways people can access things much e more easily online. Um, this is a special week, so um, I hope that you take up all the other opportunities. We um, had a, about three or four years ago, our students did the training to become dementia friends and, and trained many people in the faculty. I'm hoping that um, people, uh, the trainers of dementia friends, I'm hoping that we will see that rolling on. Um, particularly lovely to have had our students training our staff. It's often the other way around. It's nice to have it reversed. And I, I hope this goes from strength to strength. And to me, this has been the most powerful of all the days that we've had. Maria, a very special thank you to you. Thanks very much indeed. I wish you all a safe week and, and a lovely weekend. And, and thank you very much indeed. I'm officially closing this at this moment. Thank you so much, Jane, um, and to all the thanks, really, just to reiterate that and thank everybody for attending. Um, and that brings our event to the close. So just a heartfelt thanks to everyone for attending and for your contributions. Thank you so much. Have a lovely weekend.